Okay, so that was a little bit, so we had a little bit there about uh, uh, kind of the, the concepts, the idea of, you know, some fundamental ideas, again, just to review, are the fact that we have this bipartite life history, right, that, um, that the ocean is different than the land. The one thing I didn't really emphasize, but wanted to make sure I do that right here before we get into here, is that, um, again, we have uh, the big difference that we've already spoken about in this class, how we have private property on land. We don't, generally speaking, have private property in the subtitle area. So that actually creates a huge opportunity. So whereas if you and I did a theoretical study and we found out that the mountain lot, to, to conserve mountain lion populations, we need a protected area right here where campus is, that ain't gonna happen, right? Or if it's through that, that family farm next to campus, like that ain't gonna happen, right? I mean, theoretically, you could take it from eminent domain, but that, it, that's, that's not gonna happen, right? In any kind of real sense. Uh, I mean, if we're putting a freeway through, they'll do that because that's important, but, but not for a protected area. So, um, but but in, in the marine world, it's not like that, right? So if you and I did a theoretical study, we said, oh my God, Point Magoo needs to be a protected area. Theor I mean, there's challenges, of course, I'm not trying to say it's easy, but, but we could. The land ownership is not a barrier to do that. And so, um, and that's what we've actually done here in California in, in the last uh, couple decades. Okay, so, so anyway, so those things, that, that, that sort of public land or, or, or the potential, the land is not yet, quote unquote, privately controlled. We have bartate, bipartite life history. We have overexploitation of these populations. All that means that, that a lot of the most interesting thinking and theory um, these days is in the marine world in terms of protected areas because we can actually do this stuff and we can test these, these sort of large scale questions and things of that nature easier than we can in many terrestrial settings. And then another one, just to make sure I emphasize this, is uh, also the importance of biogeographic Island, bioge island biogeography theory, right? This idea that, that um, thinking of the world as islands, right? As sort of remnants of habitat or remnants of a once contiguous place that's now smaller, that thinking is also fundamental to a lot of our thinking of, of uh, protected areas. And also the idea of wilderness, as we mentioned before. Okay, all right, so let's turn to some examples that we have. Um, firstly, any questions from that first stuff? First stuff? Making sense what we're talking about? Okay, so let's talk about some examples of marine protected areas. So, so we have these large scale marine protected areas. In some cases, people will just say LSMPA is a shorthand for that. But so these are, the, these are big honking individuals. I'll show you a map at the very end about where we are with the current state of things. But, but these, these are very large swaths of the ocean, okay? Um, and really, they are so large, they really are now fundamentally a different thing. Um, I mentioned the reserve where I did my PhD, where Dr. Steele's husband did his PhD, where I helped him do his PhD, was very small, right? Micro, like a few Sierra Halls worth of size, right? You, you know, we could have, Car I could hire Carson and say, Carson, you sit on the, I don't know why I'm picking on you today. We could hire Jordy and have Jordy sit on the cliff and just watch for, people trying to do illegal fishing or whatever, right? We could. That's a, that's a, right today, if I had the money, I could hire him and we would do it and he could enforce it. Or I could even give him a boat and he could sit out there to chase away people, right? <laughs> Once, you guys should have taken our boating safety class and then you could do that. But, so, but, um, but, but these things, these large scale, ain't, that ain't happening, right? Much work is going on into autonomous underwater vehicles, satellites, I mean, this is way too big for me to hire a person or even two or three or four or five or 10 people, right? So it's fundamentally a different beast. And also if I asked Jordy, hey, is, how's the, how's the, what's the health of that, that marine protected area? He would, he would know, or he could put on a scuba tank or look for a, a couple days and he go, oh yeah, here's, here's how many fish are, right? It's, it, it's, it's understandable. These things, oh my God, migratory tuna populations and it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's so large, it is, it, we need to treat it as a different management category from traditional protected areas for all the different metrics. But anyway, okay. So, um, uh, so for example, uh, uh, these large scale uh, marine protected areas would be, so when I say 150,000 square kilometers, what does that mean? Sometimes it's hard to get a sense of that. 
That would be going from Malibu to Monterey and then the coast to Nevada. That's what we're talking about in terms of large scale. These are large, large areas, right? Um, and, and, or, or another way to say it is that's about 40% of the land area of the terrestrial area of California. These are big, big parts of the ocean. Um, we have 22 of these as of last year uh, around the planet, right? Um, uh, and we have some, we have some that are even way bigger than even that, more than a million square kilometers, right? And so that, what's a million square kilometers? That's the state of California plus the state of Oregon plus the state of Washington plus the state of Nevada. That is, that's bigger than most countries on the planet, right? I mean, that, 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 that's a huge, uh, huge beast. We have six of those right now, four of which are fully protected. Oh, okay, one other, one other quick note. Uh, I don't think I talked about this. Um, and it'll become apparent as we, as we have this conversation. There is a range of what we can do with protected areas. There's different categories. I, I, I tangentially mentioned it, but I want to be real explicit, right? So there's a range of things we could do, right? Some things you can't do commercial fishing, but you can do recreational fishing. Some things you can fish for um, fin fish, but not for invertebrates or that kind of stuff, right? For clarity, um, I'll try to use the term fully protected, uh, meaning no extraction of biological resources, except for maybe occasional scientific monitoring, but, but, but no, no recreational, no hobbyists, no anything, okay? So, so that is the easiest thing to see, right? Unprotected versus fully protected. That's where we're gonna see the greatest contrast. So there, there, there is a range and most protected areas are not that fully protected, but when we talk about the evidence, it's clearest to see, talk about the evidence of the fully protected MPA versus the others. Does that make sense? Okay. And sometimes that's called, a, or, or, I'll call, or also called a full fishery closure MPA is another, another term for that, but that's the idea. Okay. Um, Okay, this large scale marine protected area, real ideas about this really get going when we establish the, um, uh, the Great Barrier Reef as a, as a formal, what we would now consider a formal marine protected area in 1975. And these large scale MPAs have a tremendous amount of trouble, not just the ones we talked about in terms of measuring and stuff, but particularly with enforcement. And so these are what those sites look like. This is, this is the most recent map, which was produced just before the pandemic. Um, so there's a few others here, but, but, but have a look. So, um, so the uh, light blue reference the exclusive economic zone of a particular country. Um, the, the dark blue is just the, would be the high seas. And, uh, and then the red outlines here indicate one of these large scale marine protected areas. So what, what pattern do you guys see from these? Where are they? They're near the coast. They're near the coast. Um, or, or yeah, or near coastlines, yeah, or islands or something. Yeah, right, so they're not in the open ocean. So they're in areas where one or more country has, has you know, legal control of the goings on there. Are they by the U.S. mainland? Are they by the South American mainland? They're in the South Pacific, right? Again, the same pattern where, where there's fewer people, let's put them there right? The same pattern that we saw in terrestrial uh, protected area establishment. Uh, let's put them there, right? And, and indeed, the largest ones are in these areas with the, the fewest number of, of people, right? Or the, or the lowest island population, for example, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, Carson. This is all of them, though, right? Uh, I, I don't... There, there aren't any in the Atlantic, are there, Claire? Yeah, no, this is all of them. This, all of the large scale marine okay, protected areas. So this, is, this isn't all the marine protected areas, this is all the, the, the big honking ones. Okay, so here's where we were as of last year. So, um, so we have the name of the marine protected, and again, these are this, I'm here, yeah, this is the large scale beast. This is the biggest beasts out there. Okay, so this is not all the 
individuals, all, not all the 20,000 from across the world. So the name of it, what country it's in, and almost all of these are in a country except for this newest one in Antarctica, which is the Ross Sea uh, uh, one, which, which was sort of established under the Antarctic Treaty, essentially, the signatories of the Antarctic Treaty. But all the other, that's the, that's the first um, uh, open ocean one, but all the other ones are in somebody's territorial waters. And then I just have it in square kilometers just to, so you can kind of do a, a rough eyeball. Um, and what percentage of that is in that full protection, that full closure to any fishing at all, right? And then um, uh, what proportion of all of the marine protected areas across the world that, in this case, have full or, if not full, very, very close to full, very, very high protection, what percentage? And so what pattern do you see there? Hello, Dr. Spies. Uh, so what pattern do you see there, you guys? Okay, so this is so this is the ache, this is how much surface area of the ocean is in the protected is in the large scale protected area. The next column is of that. So, for example, the Rossi of this 2.04 um, uh, million square kilometers. How much of that two million square kilometers is fully protected or very 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 highly protected? And so it's saying that 79 percent of that. So most of it is in like you can't fish it all in it. And then this is that same thing, but for all MPAs, including the small ones all across the planet, what proportion of all the no-take MPAs of the, of the, of, what percentage of the area of all the no-take MPAs around the planet is that? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. So then take a look at this and what, what, what pattern do you guys see from this or, or, or what, what, what stands out to you? Oh yeah, right. Yep. Uh, one thing I, I noticed was that uh, for number two and three, uh -huh. the, uh, like the second one has a higher uh, like area, mm -hmm. has a low, lower percentage mm -hmm. than the last column, the mm -hmm. third one. Yeah. So so um, right. But even that low percentage, it's 64%. So even that one that has relatively, uh, or has, has the lowest amount of the total area in a fully no-take uh, uh, condition, it's more than half of it. Oh, that you referring to the last part of the total, the 14%? Like the total of like all MPAs? Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so, okay, good. So if you look at that, if you look at these, just these three MPAs, so let's look at the two that Jordy was talking about, and, and the, so number one, number two, and number three here on the list, right? So that's almost, that's like more than 40% of all of the planet's no-take area is in these three places, including one of which was in international waters, and we, we know the challenges of enforcing things in international waters, right? So what that's saying is that, um, well, sorry, any, anything else? Anything else you guys notice? Yeah. It seems like the more area that a marine, marine protected area takes up, the less, the lower percentage, it, there's a lower percentage of... Um, Fully protected? protected yeah, totally. Yeah. So as, as you get bigger and bigger, it's, it's harder and harder to have, it's harder to do anything. But in particular, it's harder and harder to have a complete fishery closure. Yeah, totally. I think part of that is the Pacific is on the island too. Is it there? And I don't know what's okay. I think the zone was there. That's true. You couldn't necessarily like shut down all of the Pacific and Lagoon that island was sufficient to use the Mm hmm. Yeah, so most of these, uh, like Palau, um, Ascension, Chagos, um, uh, uh, well, Chagos is actually an interesting one. So this is this is just changed. This is just announced the who's gonna. This is gonna be handed back to the native peoples. Um, but uh, but yeah. So leave, so leave number seven off, I guess, for a second. But but um, but most of these other ones, there's there's folks that that live there, right? And so the question is, 
do they have a strong, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I'll hold that until we get to those examples. But yeah, good, good observation. Other ones, other thoughts? Um, so this is, this is, it's important for you guys to see. So we need to know the big patterns. We need to know the summary statistics, right? We need to know the, the, the average this, the max that, right? Those are important. But when we have an uneven distribution of this, of a particular management type, and in this case, we have a handful of these very large marine protected areas that are just in every which way different from most of our marine protected areas, they can skew our data. So if you just said, hey, how much of the planet how, how much of our marine protected areas across the planet have full protection? You say, oh, like 40, you know, more than 40%, right? Which sounds kind of good maybe, but it's all coming from a handful of spots. And if those, if, if one little thing about that statistic is wrong, you have a massively different interpretation of what's actually going on the ground versus what's actually happening. So these, these, these large scale marine protected areas exert a disproportionate influence on, on uh, stuff. Did you say something, Brent? Okay, so let's look at some examples. Okay, so here's that one I talked about, the first one in Catalina. So here's Catalina. So this is where I work. This thing here is called Bird Rock. Um, uh, in fact, many of your uh, ESRM faculty have been out here, done, done things out here. Um, but, uh, so, okay, so you guys haven't been there. Have guys, have, has anybody been to Catalina? Jordy, and where'd you, where'd, you, where'd you guys go? Avalon or Two Harbors? Avalon? Two Har oh, Two Harbors, good. <laughs> A city or not city part? Okay, so Avalon. Okay, all right, cool. Um, so awesome. So Jason. So uh, so so Jason. But that's 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 cool. Um, uh, but so so um, basically, what we're doing is we're, we're like in LA, looking out to the sea, and so we see Catalina Island, and this is a very <laughs> unusual shot because it's green. Doesn't usually look this green. It's a Mediterranean ecosystem thing. But anyway, but what we're looking at here. This there's a there's a little indentation right here, which is um, which is called Big Fisherman's Cove, and that's where a marine station is. And so this is the University of Southern California operates a marine station. They don't have many people that do anything there, but people from other universities mostly use this facility. And so, and so this red line, I've kind of eyeballed it for you, is the, is the area of the marine protected area, or, or the, excuse me, the boundary of the marine protected area. So it doesn't go far out into the ocean. It basically hugs the cliffs. And so this was established practically. So this is a bunch of marine biologists that would go out here and do stuff. And like me, I don't, know, I don't remember if I ranted to you guys about my PhD project, but I, I had many challenges doing my PhD, one of which were these yahoos that would come in and anchor on my, I had one of my experiments was using terracotta plates to look at how algae and things recruit to it, which sounded brilliant and was a great surface for things to recruit to. It's horrible if someone drops an anchor on it, it totally just doesn't, doesn't respond well to big metal things being dropped on it. Anyway, so I, I put my stuff out here and one, I had, one of my sites was here and um, one day during a 4th of July weekend and there's a big sign hanging off the cliff that says marine protected area, no anchoring, you know, no, no, no dropping anchor, don't tie up to buoys, nothing like that. And this big, and not to be stereotypical, but this big cigarette boat rolled in with a, large gentleman uh, with a big gold chain and large sideburns and two-tone sunglasses drinking a beer and then like, like comes in and like stops and makes this huge wake. And then uh, all these screaming kids start jumping off the back of his boat with like snorkel gear. And then he, you know, lifts his belly up and then walks to the front and I, and we're, we're, I'm in a very, very slow boat, like coming here. And I see this guy, oh my God. And I'm like, ee, and it's going like, you know, like two knots. You know, I'm like, ee, and I see this guy and he takes his anchor and he throws his anchor right on top of my, right underneath the sign that says no anchoring. And so it's one of the few times I really, really lost my stuff and just yelled not nice things at people. Anyway, but the idea with this marine protected area was that it was for people like me, right? Doing this stuff. And so that, that, that no, that, people could put instrumentation out and be assured that it wouldn't be disturbed, right, was the idea. And so the way back when, back in the day in the 60s and 70s, the, the research director would go up here and you can't tell this is a hill and sit on the hill and like drink beer in the afternoon and stuff. And if he saw someone coming up, he'd have a bullhorn and he'd say, hey, no anchoring. He'd shoo people away. And if they didn't listen, he had a CB radio that he would call the harbor patrol, which is two harbors is over here. 
and he would send essentially the police boat out and they would go, you can't anchor here, right? So it was relatively small, very tight into the, to the land and it's, it was definitely enforceable. And there's all kinds of other places to anchor here. So yeah, there's that Yahoo dude that came into my area and there still are silly people. But by and large, most people are like, oh, okay, if I really want to anchor, I can just go over here, right? So it's not, it's not a huge thing to motor five more minutes to do whatever. So that, that, this is a classic, um, uh, yeah. Back when, when Dr. Anderson was getting his PhD, the navigation on boats, there wasn't like, you couldn't tell where these these places were, right? These designated MPAs were, or, or no take zones or anything. It's not like if you go out to the dunes or something like that, where it says like nature preserve, don't come in. It was hard to tell. Now, if you have a navigation, there's really no excuse because any, any boat that can get out to, to Catalina now has a navigation system and there's boundaries on it. Like, so you know when your boat crosses it, um, but also with technology, with like U.S. Fish and Wildlife and stuff, they're, they're the Coast Guard, they actually can be like miles away where you, you can't even see their boats and they have binoculars where they will watch you and they can tell, you have no idea they're watching and they can tell when a fishing rod goes over, <laughs> all they need is just the motion of a rod in the zone, they, they come over and, and you'll get sighted. So there is, I would say we do a really good job compared to other um, states and countries of the enforcement aspect of it because we can really enforce these big stretches of areas now with, with technology the way that it is. I wouldn't be surprised in like 10, 15 years that they have like little mini drones or something that uh -huh. they're doing it too. But also most like fishing vessels, wreck boats and stuff like that, they actually have to have their radar on so they can, they can actually detect where they're at at all, even from the main coast. They can tell where they're fishing at all times. So enforcement now, there's like no excuse to cross those boundaries. Totally, yeah. totally. Good, okay. So, um, so, okay, so th this is like the classic one. So small, this is a micro, this is little teeny tiny, right? And so that's many of our things like that. Let's look at some of the different uh, marine protected areas around the world. And, uh, you know, Dr. Steele and Spees, you guys chime in about this. So, for example, here's look at, let's look at an example in the Coral Sea. This is in New Caledonia. This is off, um, or this is kind of close to Australia. Um, this has been in the news of late. Maybe you guys have seen this with the, some of the um, social unrest and, um, and efforts to um, uh, have uh, home rule again in these islands um, as opposed to uh, uh, you know, rule from far away France. And it's just caused all these um, uh, challenges. And so, so there, there's, there's still negotiations going on, but... Um, uh, anyway, basically, this is this is a, an island in the in the South Pacific. Um, so they decided they wanted to start looking at this marine protected area thing um, several years ago, and so they started their planning in a thing called the Pacific Islands Forum, which is a which is a, um, a coming together of of Pacific Island nations, primarily small Pacific Island nations, where they can sort of share ideas and best practices. It's it's not a it's not a um, it's not a governing body per se, but it's more of a, a networking uh, way to to uh, get um, help on things. Um, and essentially, these guys create or, 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 or took did all the planning and stuff, um, and uh, created a law in 2014 um, to to uh, protect some of their marine resources. And just this one creation took, because it's a territory of France, took France's marine protected area of, of Fran French territorial waters from 4% to 16%. So this was a huge boost. This is, this is again, another one of these kind of large scale uh, guys that come in. The question is that we see with this and many of our other marine protected areas that have come in the last few decades in these, in these small island nations is what do we actually do? And, and is this really a marine protected area or is it really a, a marine protected area that's being enforced to the level that the uh, aspirations say it should? 
So in this case, the extent of the marine protected area was all of the exclusive economic zone around um, this, you know, around the terrestrial area. Um, and so again, this is also a pattern we see a lot. So the law was passed in 2014. There was no marine protected area. The law was to create one. But what you immediately see starting showing up on reports and stuff is people act as if it is a marine protected area. Um, so they had a few years to figure out the details and, um, and we've done some work in the Cook Islands and, people, and they initially said this is gonna be a sister site to what they've done there. And the idea here is that um, we're gonna shut down fishing activity. Obviously a small island like this, a lot of the fish is used for consumption is a subsistence fishery, is what people eat, right? So what are we gonna do? And so the idea is, well, or the argument is, was, well, if we make this marine protected area, we're not gonna allow people to fish as much, but then it's gonna be prettier reefs and things, and then more people will come on to see our reefs, and so we'll get more ecotourism, and so then we'll have money, and then with that money, we can buy food, is the, is the argument, okay? The other big worry about all this is, is how this happens. Hey, should we have a marine protected area? Sounds good. We have a marine protected area. Uh, as far as the details, you figured out in a few years that pattern has is, is be, been becoming um, common. And so the term, the worry there is this so-called paper park. Have you guys heard of the paper park term before? So the idea is it exists on paper only. So yes, I can look in a database and I can find it. And yes, there's a map and yes, there's a this or that or whatever, there's a name for it or something, but it's not really doing any protection. So it exists as a park only on a piece of paper or only on the computer screen is the idea. And so people are saying that this is a paper park, that it, it, doesn't, it hasn't really changed fishing pressure. Um, so that's, uh, that's there. Another one is Pippa, again, that Dr. Stone mentioned that he uh, was, uh, had a, a strong hand in helping to create. Um, another, this is another big, huge, you know, Higante Reserve. Um, and, and Dr. Stone was working with the New England Aquarium when, uh, he, when this stuff happened. It became this hugely popular thing, right? So the then uh, prime minister would get, got all these awards from like National Geographic and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it was fantastic, blah, 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 blah. And I should say this is, so this, this greater area is called the Phoenix Island, called the Phoenix Islands. But just for clarity, the, the, country here at the center is the Republic of Kiribati. It looks like, if you try to read it, it looks like Kiribati. If you try to say it, that's not how it's pronounced. It's Kiribati is how you, you, you speak it. So, so if you hear people say Kiribati, it's, there's, there's no S in the name, right? So it's a little bit confusing, but um, okay. So again, uh, the prime minister gets all these awards, everybody's all this kind of stuff. And and hey, you know, um, we're doing such a great job. And oh my God, the MPAs are going to save us, all that jazz. Um, uh, it became a platform where people could talk about, hey, our, our, our small island nations are really um, hurting. And in particular, this dovetails with climate change. So the, to Kiribati, like the maximum is, I don't know, Claire might know, it's like, three or six feet above sea level, it's, it's, they're very flat islands. So these guys are very worried about climate change. And they're very worried that if sea level progresses at the rate it's going, they may well not have uh, a home in a few decades, right? And so they're one of the big, they're one of the big proponents of international payments of the developed world that has done a lot of the emissions to these small island nations so they can try to adapt and have more resources to adapt. So that's when this, so that's also part of this conversation that we have to include. And so the, the argument started making very explicitly, hey, look, you guys should give us money. Also, but we understand there's no milk for free. We're going to take some hits too. One of the hits we're going to take is we're going to shut down fishing on our in our areas, right? So we're taking a hit. We're, we're taking a hit for the team. And that was very explicitly made in pitches for funding for climate change uh, 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 money being transferred. 
Uh, the then president was, you know, as I said, lauded as a hero, um, but uh, it maybe hasn't worked as well as we thought. So um, starting about a decade ago, these sto stories started coming out about, wait, I thought we shut down tuna fishing. I thought we shut down these things. And it turns out we didn't really shut it down, right? So, um, so fishing didn't stop the way it was originally said it would stop. And so, um, and, how, and how this works is for tuna. So tuna fishing in the open ocean is tuna fishing in the open ocean. But tuna fishing in a country's territorial waters, you have to get their permission, right? At least theoretically, right? And so that's usually with the issuance of licenses. So you would, you would, a commercial operator would get some license to harvest X number of fish or whatever. So essentially these guys were still selling tuna harvest licenses even though this was supposed to be this whole EEZ, you know, every, everything's closed, et cetera. And so, so this really um, has been a problem. <laughs> I'll just say it like that, right? So, so yes, on paper it says it's this protected area, but is it really? Um, so commercial fishing supposedly stopped here. Um, uh, and, and then we, this also plays into something else that Dr. Stone mentioned, which was the geopolitics of the Pacific with China. So China is really trying to have uh, entrance to many of these small island nations. And so China has now bought out the government of Kiribati. So now the old folks that were in charge, no longer in charge. So now the people that, the, the prime minister, I wouldn't say a puppet regime, I think that's maybe not accurate, but um, extremely tight with China. And so, um, you know, they're like, oh, so Ch Chinese fishing guys want to go fish and get tuna? Like, okay, that sounds good to us, right? So all these things are kind of coming together to, to, to sort of complicate the marine protected area um, network. Um, uh, and so the, and I have some quotes here, basically, um, it, it's a problem. Kiribati left the Pacific Forum a couple years ago. Right, so so they're getting closer and closer to China. They have attempted to um, redo an old U.S. air base that's not been used since World War II, that would that would allow much easier spying in Hawaii and other other stuff like that. Um, I mean, it, it's getting really crazy, and so it's essentially, um, as we'll hear when maybe Professor Spees talks to us about fishing, China. Statistics of fishing from China are very dubious, and it's, it's very difficult to know what they're actually doing. And these are the folks that are sort of now in with this uh, government uh, with regards to this one. Here's a story from the Cook Islands. So this is where, this is Dr. Dr. Steele right there, Dr. Lambrinos. And there's Dr. Steele's husband with the glasses on right there pointing to the map. Um, and so uh, for several years, we uh, went to the Cook Islands. We took a class to the Cook Islands. Um, it'd be great to go back sometime, but um, but so this is us talking with, and what, what the Cook Islands did is small na small island nation, they essentially shut down what they would call, what we would call the Environmental Protection Agency, and they shunted all the work to this nonprofit. So they sort of essentially contract with this nonprofit. So we're on the, the deck of this nonprofit um, talking with them, and this was as they were uh, proposing the marine protected area um, several years ago. And so, and so we're looking at a map that, that shows islands and, and what would be what, et cetera. Um, I should also say before we get into this that, that um, uh, I mentioned before that the modern idea of marine protected areas is very much a Western idea and as we're doing them, and that's true. But Polynesian cultures, brought by and large, also had a very strong tradition, different from ours, whereas ours is, ours is like, here, this table is a protected area. And it's a protected area from here on out. Their form of protected areas was more um, uh, temporary. And so uh, usually run by a tribal chief. And so the idea would be, oh, there's some problem on this reef or this, or this fishery is having some problems. We're not going to harvest it for a period of time. It could be a short period of time. It could be a year or so, or it could be until the chief decides differently, right? But basically shut it down. And then based on conditions on the ground. And then when conditions on the ground get better, you, you release it to be exploited again. And so that, is, that, that, that 
rough idea is much of the Pacific. That's, much, that's how many Polynesian cultures dealt with um, problem areas. So it's like an MPA, but it's like a temporary MPA. Do you guys want to add anything to that? Um, I'll just say my time in Polynesia, but I worked in Marae a couple of years, and there, there's just a cultural way of going about fishing too that's just been intentional with them over generations where they don't over exploit any species. And so um, I'm really into food. You'll hear that when I talk about fisheries next week about the different types of food. I, I'm a fisherman and conservation biologist because I want to conserve the things that I like to eat. Um, they're very much the same way. So there'd be times where we would have, um, you know, tuna and then they would go out and they'd go catch a tuna or something like that. But you have, it's, it's, these are families that own large pieces of land and they're all kind of eating together and, and it's a big communal thing. Um, everyone, everyone gets like their party every single week. It's like their church day is, is Saturday nights. So Saturday nights, it's like this big festival and then they go out and they go fishing, but like they have talks about, oh no, we, we just had tuna. Go, go get some parrotfish. Oh, we've had parrotfish. Go get some, like, little shad. And they, they eat all different types of stuff, right? And it's a lot of times when they have their big banquet kind of things, they'll have different varieties of species. But it's not just like, oh, there's tuna, run there's tuna running year-round in Morea, right? There's Dorado, Mahi Mahi running year-round, right? And so if you had the Western culture here, it would just be like, okay, let's just go get the big things that, ha that we all love and, and just go overfish them. They just have this cultural identity, or maybe that's not the right word, but, but the way that they see seafood is, yeah, we've taken too much of that. We're going to start eating more of this now. And then that, that is, they just have all these different meals. And it's cool because some of them, the, the chef, when we when I went out there with UCLA, um, we took undergrads out there. It was called the Marine Bio um, Quarter in the Q. Um, we have a Polynesian caterer. That's, that we hire to, to make us three meals a day. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, they'll make the traditional meal for Sangru, which is like awesome. It's like coconut milk and tuna. It's like a ceviche type thing. And this and the, and the, the students want it all, all the time. They're like, no, maybe in a couple weeks we'll, get, we'll do that again. But then they're out there hand lining like these little shad that most of you would be like, I don't want to eat that. But um, for like, like um, angelfish, like a lot of the stuff that hmm. you see in aquariums that are like this big, they're on shish kebabs, right? And so they are very, very diverse in their diet. And it is kind of that sense of what they see on the reef and what they see in abundance. And if it's, if they've taken too much, they pause for a little bit. It's pretty cool. I want to mention about, so I don't know if you were talking about this, hmm. uh, but uh, about temporal closures. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Ernst is talking about like spatial closures is like we draw a line on a map and that's closed forever. Um, but a place I worked in the in Fiji where they have traditional ownership of various areas of the ocean, they would also do uh, temporal closures as well as spatial closures. So that if they wanted to raise money for the village or there was some like big funeral celebration or something, they would have these areas that are traditionally closed, but they allow you know, the whole village will go out with these big circle, they're not really nets, they're circles of palm fronds, and they'll corral all these reef fish, and then they'll, in some cases, eat the fish, in some cases, sell the fish to raise funds, um, but they are temporal rather than spatial closures. Cool. Cool. One of the coolest things I've ever seen fishing, so I don't know if I'm going to talk about Maria, so I'll just say this. I went out fishing with a local when I was out there, um, he's one, if you're just driving around Marais, it's a very small island. There's just, on the side of the road, they have just these pieces of PVC and they'll hang the fish for the day. And you can go out, you can get a tuna, a skipjack, that's like this big, and it costs like 30 bucks. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> and so I went out fishing with them. Um, and he had a harpoon, so we went, I've seen videos of this mill, I'll try to find the video and show it to you, but they go out on these small boats and they have like 20, 30 horsepower motors, and they're usually out by themselves. Like it's very much, I'm gonna go out, it's my livelihood, I'm gonna go out and catch something and I go on the side of the road and I sell it. Um, and a lot of it when like Dorado or Tuna are going, they're, um, 
it's, it's called puddling. So when they're ready to feed, you can actually see ripples on the surface. So they're on the surface and they're ready to feed. And so they'll motor over and then they hug the outboard. So they straddle the outboard like this <laughs> and they start steering it with their legs because they have a spear and they have the kill switch that's attached to the motor onto their belt buckle. So then they'll chase it down and their, their, their um, you know, feet are like locked into like this, they get grip. And right when they see one, they will jump off the boat. It kills the motor and then they spear something. That's ridiculous. It's, it's that's insane. awesome. It's that's dangerous. awesome. <laughs> super dangerous, right? That sounds super fun. Because um, a lot of times they'll go on the outer reef and it's like very, it's like going on like backside of, of you know, Channel Islands where it's, it's, it's pretty heavy. But it's, it's, it's definitely like culturally, it's just an awesome example of like how the, the community manages their, their fishery. Um, and I don't think there really is any NPAs in Maria. I'll have to look at that. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, there are like they might. Uh, awesome. Awesome. So the Cook Islands are really, I mean, they're all these islands are interesting for different reasons. The Cook Islands are pretty crazy. They have um, the uh, fourth largest EEZ by ratio of any country in the world. Um, and it's because they're these little teeny tiny micro islands, but they're, they're this sort of pearl necklace splayed way over um, this region of the South Pacific, kind of close towards New Zealand. Um, and so they have this, so the area is only 240 square kilometers of all the islands all together, but they have more than 2 million, they control more than 2 million square kilometers of the ocean. So a huge chunk of the ocean. Um, they're also funky in that they're, called a free association. So they're not a territory of another country, but they are in this weird political agreement with New Zealand. So, so they have their own rule and they've had their own rule for, you know, more than 50 years. They have their own legislature. They have their own governing laws and everything and, and stuff like that. But they also have... Um, representation in the New Zealand parliament. And so they're freely associated with New Zealand. And so they also have, so they're citizens of the Cook Islands. And if you guys go watch the Olympics, you'll see a Cook Islands flag, you know, so they, they're, they're, they have representation in the UN and things like that. But they also have representation in New Zealand. And so in this era of changing times with climate change and all that kind of stuff, it's very easy for, and, and New Zealand and Australia are pretty tight and New Zealand and Australia have this essentially not really a border. I mean, they do, but, but essentially you can, you can, if you're a New Zealander, you can go work in Australia, like as long as you want and Australia you can go work in New Zealand and stuff. So, um, so essentially through this door, a lot of Cook Islanders have left which is actually causing a brain drain and there's, there's a lot of issues. Young people, as soon as they have a wonderful education system, as soon as they hit 18, a lot of them leave. Boom, leave, J get on a plane, go to New Zealand, see their auntie for a week or so, say hi, and then get on a plane and go to Australia. And a lot of the population works in the mining industry in Australia. Works in the mining industry for 40 years or whatever, make you know Western salaries and all that kind of stuff, and then move back home. Right, and so there's a lot of cultural issues and challenges. One of the things that's helped do is that's bring that's brought back a lot of sort of Western ideas to the islands. And protected areas were one of those kind of ideas. Um, so, so strong cultural traditions still, very strong dancing and 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 other um, uh, cultures that have not been watered down as in some other islands. Um, very much so a tourist centric economy. The 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they had a lot of agriculture that they would grow bananas and citrus and stuff. And, and that was a big part of their economy. That's pretty much all gone away. And now it's basically tourism. And that's where most of tourism and then, and then commercial fishing are, are where the economies of these small island nations are, that, that's where they're getting their money basically. 
uh, yeah, okay, so just like before, 2012, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna establish these marine protected areas, right? And so, yep, we're gonna do this. And um, uh, so this TIS is this, is this NGO I mentioned that it's sort of the contracted to do a lot of the environmental work, like monitoring and things like that. And then um, uh, this group of, of big ocean things. And so they said, hey, so the plan is gonna be, um, uh, we're gonna go 50 miles out. We're going to start 50 miles out. So they did not want to have a lot of the tight in waters that like, like Brenton and, and Claire were talking about that, you know, traditional people, people are going out fishing on the reef and stuff. They didn't want to mess with that. So their marine protected area is about high seas, open ocean type of, uh, pr primarily, primarily areas. And so, um, again, they established it, but they didn't know what it was going to be. And so it showed up on paper, but it wasn't clear what the regulate, what the goals were going to be. And again, all this uh, rhetoric was, is this really doing anything, right? Is this really changing anything? Because now we've, we've done the hard part, but we haven't made any of the, we haven't told anybody what the bad part is, right? We just did the, the fun part. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think we'll, We'll, let's skip that for now. Um, okay, let's look at some other examples because we're almost out of time. Uh, unless Claire wants to say anything else about Cook Island stuff. Okay, so, um, so that, that's essentially where we are now. So they're still debating the, the rules of what is gonna be allowed in the marine protected area or not. Okay, let's look at some other examples close to home. So here's one of the best examples, I think. Uh, and it's important you guys see this, so you guys definitely pay attention to this. If you're falling asleep, whatever, make sure you're watching this because this is a, a, a classic thing here. So these are the Oculina reefs off of Florida. This is kind of near, we were talking earlier about Cape Canaveral and all that and the percent protection targets. This is kind of near there. So this is, um, so this is this stuff called, uh, this is a coral, but it's a deep sea coral. So it's not a coral that has a lot of zooxanthellae that's up near the surface. It's coral that's that's, that's getting its nutrition from phytoplankton and from plankton, right? So, so it's down deep. Uh, there, and, and it's also not like a lot of our corals like mm, honking because I hit the waves. These are very delicate. So these are much finer branched in that kind of stuff. Uh, coral, I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, uh, an individual head can be way more than a century old. So they're very slow growing. Um, and essentially these are on pinnacles and ridges down down subtitle, right? So the, the little rocky outcrops and then these, these coral uh, populations are on these things. And they're particularly, they're, they're all over, but they're particularly concentrated in this about 170 kilometer swath where I have the, the, green, um, the green box over there. Uh, for the coral, the coral are monospecific on many of these things. So it's not like the, the tropical reefs where we have coral species A, species B, species B. Most of the structures come from this one type of coral. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of diversity there, but the diversity is not in the coral. The diversity is in the fish and the invertebrates and stuff. Um, and the, while an individual head might be 100 years or so, the reefs, the reef mass, we think, are well over 15, you know, 10, 15,000 years old. So they're very long live structures. Um, and they're really valuable for all these, you know, all kinds of fish that are, that are highly important off of Florida. So this is what the coral looks like. It's very finely branched, right? There's a piece, uh, right there to sit, and there's a little crab in that little one there. Um, and, and we've, and, uh, um, they've been described for a long time, but they were initially described by stuff that would wash on the beach from a storm. So people didn't know where they came from originally. So these initial, initial descriptions were all from from broken pieces of coral that were wafed. Okay, so here's the history. So 1960s, people are out there mostly doing hook and line, like what Brenton was talking about, like regular fishing pole kind of fish around. Um, and, uh, and some trawling, but, but particularly early on, mostly just uh, hook and line. And then people started figuring out there were some spots where they got a lot of fish, a lot of these grouper and these targeted fish. And like, ah, oh. and so the fishermen started figuring out there was these, these hot spots for, for fishing. So eventually in early 70s, some of the marine biology types hear about it. And they're like, wait, what's going on here? So they, bench, they, they start um, doing the first real quantitative search, subtitle search with uh, you know, um, uh, submersibles. And in 1975, they discover these big oculina reefs, right? So big news, all super cool. And so initially we start to petition the um, 
NIMFS, so National Marine Fishery Service, which you guys should remember is a division of NOAA. And then something we've not talked about yet, and maybe Brenton will get to this, but fishery management councils, right? So this is our structure under our current federal way of regulating fisheries. We have these different regional bodies that set how many fish we can take. And so, and so he petitions both the, the government agency and the regulatory body to, hey, can we start to set some of these areas aside? And so it takes a long time. It takes about a decade after we discover them for a small area, about 777 square kilometers, to be designated a, quote, habitat area of particular concern, an HAPC. An HAPC. Um, uh, and so, hey, maybe that'll help. We do a resurvey in the early 90s and find death everywhere, right? So, so this reef is, area is messed up and it doesn't look like it's getting any better. So therefore, a couple years later, we expand that. We expand that area where we tell people, hey, please don't use lines and trawling and stuff. And now we turn it into a no-take. So you can't do anything in this area. No, nothing. No, no shallow water, anything like that. Just nothing. Um, and we start the first restoration experiments. Angelina's question about can we do this for, for active management. So we, we start to try to help the process along, help jumpstart the process along. So these oculina are serving just like the kelp that we talked about earlier as this ecosystem engineer, right? So it's fundamentally creating, uh, it has, it's having a greater impact on the ecosystem than you would think by just its numbers alone. So it's creating the structure from the structure. There's places for for prey to hide from predators and it's all, all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, by 96, we ban all anchoring in there. Um, uh, we designated a, a term uh, essential fish habitat, which is another one of our sort of tools to sort of uh, help with management. Um, we expanded again in 2000. Um, we renew it in 2004 um, because there was some pressure from um, the Bush administration to eliminate fisher, fish, fishing restrictions. Um, so it's basically rechristened. Re um, and then, of course, in 2021, the Trump administration, which doesn't like regulations, is like, why don't we fish for shrimp there? So they try to eliminate it to say, that, say we could go sh um, get shrimp there. Um, but uh, the uh, tw um, 2021, uh, Noah, uh, and, and that was as he was leaving office. And then the next year, Noah says, yeah, no. We're not, that's, we're, we're not going to do that. But thanks for letting us explore that. Um, and so this is what it looks like, right? So this is what we see on these reefs. So when you, when you go now to this reef, what you see is this is the coral. So the white thing is the coral. And then this other stuff, this stringy stuff, this is all fishing line that, is, that, peop, that fishermen were using to do something. And it got snagged and it, and it broke off this piece of coral. And then they cut the line. And so now the line is getting encrusted with things up. But, but basically evidence of a direct impact from the fishing uh, activity on the reef. So this is what an untrawled uh, uh, coral head looks like, or, or, or part of this reef, right? So we have some, some other um, uh, cnidarians and stuff here. But like, this is the deal, right? So we have this, this structure and we have a bunch of these fish, you know, Diverse fish, abundant, high biomass, et cetera. This is what a trawled area looks like, an impacted area. So all the dudes are broken, right? All the pieces are broken. That the benefit of the, of the creating interstitial space and stuff doesn't exist. Yes, there are little teeny spaces down here, but that's nowhere near the same quality of, of spaces for little butterfly fish or whatever the hell it is, right? And let's see if we can play this. I mean, that's not going to play, but um, okay. Anyway, I uh, don't know why that's not playing. Let's try one more time. Hmm. Okay, maybe I'll put it online. Um, so so, so uh, that's essentially where we are. Um, I should have, where's my reef balls? Yeah, okay. So, um, so I'll just note that, that we haven't talked about the, the types of fishing. Probably doc, uh, Dr. Spees will talk about that. We mostly think of fishing as putting a line out but just want to make sure I note trawling. So trawling is different. So trawling is where we drag a structure, usually a net on the bottom. We have a weighted line on the bottom. So the bottom of the mouth uh, hangs open. 
and then we have some type of buoyant device on the top to make the, the upper part of the net stay, stay uh, open. Um, the, this is an otter trough, so these, these, they have these panels that help, that uh, uh, hydrodynamically help the mouth stay open. There's, there's various iterations, but this is the basic idea. So we're gonna drop a net down to the bottom, and then we're gonna drag it over the bottom, usually. Um, and so that's great. It's a, it's a really efficient way for getting a lot of fish, um, you know, for capturing them. But obviously, uh, if there were rigid structures, if there were pieces of coral there, and we're dragging it, we're probably gonna snap the, we're either gonna snap the coral or we're gonna snap our, snap our net or something, right? So, so they're really designed for things over soft bottom. And then let me just finish this part before you guys go. So let's finish this oculina story. So, okay, so, okay, wasn't working, wasn't working. Let's add more protected area, more protected area, more protected area. It was pretty, it was pretty clear that that wasn't gonna do it enough. And so we tried these things called reef balls starting in the 90s. So these are, these are concrete um, homes that are like about, you know, a large beach ball size, like a really extra large beach ball size area. They make them with concrete and they literally pour concrete over beach balls and then they punch out holes. So it's a, it's a concrete ball, semi-sphere. Semi Come on in. And so we put these out and we're like, hey, this will help. This will act as a recruitment source for the coral to start landing on it. So one of the thoughts was, all these broken pieces of coral, if you do have a baby piece of coral land on it, it's gonna land on one of the mobile pieces of coral and then the first wave is gonna tumble and kill it. So the idea is maybe we can create this structure and then it would be the, the, the baby coral will start to grow on it and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and then we could start to, then the reef could regrow from those spots. Um, and that, they don't work. They don't work. So in some cases, this, this is a really effective thing. For this, this species in these areas, they don't work. They're acting as so-called FADs or fish aggregating devices. So if we go out there now, you can see how, the, how the, these, group, these fish are around them, but they're not making more fish. They're just, the fish that are be around here, they're now closer, they're, they're, we can see them easier, but we're not making more fish. We're not making more stuff. So this is a failure in terms of this intervention. So with, with Oculine, the reason why I want to make sure we hit this example before we, we break here is that just because we have a marine protected area does not mean that everything's great, right? Some people would have you believe that's the end all be all of everything. If we have a robust population or a population that's doing fairly well, the marine protected area can help us recover that, those numbers or, or boost those numbers or boost diversity. But if we have something that's so nuked and maybe We'll definitely be talking about white abs, either at our, at our field trip stop or some others. But, but that's an example of the population is so nuked, it doesn't matter if all of California is a marine protected area. We need to make more babies, and, and just having a protected area ain't going to do it. So Oculina is an exa a classic example of more and more marine protected area that did not get, that has not, at least not yet, has not yielded the, the desired conservation goal. Cool? Make sense? You guys want to chime in anything about Oculina reefs? Uh, not necessarily Oculina, but there's a, cool, there's a cool exhibit that I've heard from the Pacific where they talk about their oral respiration. So it's, it's not this type of reef, but it's, it's more tropical. But they've actually had a lot of success restoring reefs that have been bleached. It takes a lot of effort. So now, like, you, you would have structures. So they have different artificial structures like this that they're putting on the reef. But you have to actually go get coral fragments and then go glue them or cement them to the reef to yep. have them established. And then it takes them a lot, really long time to grow, right? The really old thing. So, so in order to, you know, to just populate one of these large concrete balls would take a ton of effort just going in and gluing like little fragments together. So you can imagine how difficult it would be to try to get them to recruit naturally on those. That's going to take a lot longer. And, and just, It's hard, it's difficult. It's really easy to do that, or it's much easier to do that on a shallow reef where you can snorkel out real easily, right? And you can just like bring a, bring like a little paddle boat or something like that and it has a bunch of stuff you can glue them on, but these deeper reefs, it's, it makes it a little harder. Yeah, I, uh, so I have a video of Lou Key in the Florida Keys, one of our, one of our background videos from a few years ago. Um, I don't think I put another video, but there's, there's, a, there's a marine lab down there. Uh, I forget what it's called, what's it called? Shark? Moat, Moat Marine Lab. Um, they have tables like this, and 
and they have interns. It's kind of crazy. You pay to be an intern for them. It's a little strange. Uh, so it's not the poor kids going to this internship. Um, and when we did the tour of the facility, it was like, oh, this is our coral grow-up facility. And I was like, what are they doing? And literally what 90% of all the interns do is take with toothbrushes. So they have little out, they have little, little baby recruits, like little, little pieces of coral that are growing and they want them to be like, say three inches before they outplant them. And so they're like one inch and they're in these beds and they just had these kids have toothbrushes and all they do all day long, they have like their, their earbuds in, they pick up these little things and they brush off the algae off them and put them back. And it's like, I mean, Okay, but it's basically, it's basically, and, and all of it was is to produce maybe like, I don't know, 4,000 baby coral, right? Which is great, but we need about 4 billion baby coral to restore this stuff. So I, so I used to do that when I was an undergrad. So when I was at Burke, you had, you grow up, and you go, and then after you do that, you go over here, because these are the ones that are starting to grow, and you put them off. But if you go look at their, their tanks now, that's what a lot of those probably have populated those tanks, but now they're starting to give them to researchers so they could go transplant them in other areas. And that's what like a lot of what Aquarium of the Pacific does too. So it's, that's something you're interested in. A lot of aquariums are doing that kind of work now. It's pretty cool. And one of our uh, colleagues is, is working on um, uh, heat or warm water resistant coral. So we, we, even though like, you know, we all talk, we've all seen how the seas are getting warmer and warmer and warmer and sort of more resistant to sort of climate change and bleaching. And so that's also a tool people are using to try to put out these genotypes that are more resistant.